This will be the overview for the epistle of Paul to Titus. And it's got 46 verses, 3 chapters, and around 896 words. It's around 62 to 67 AD, written between Paul's first and second Roman imprisonments. Titus was a Gentile convert of Paul. As you read in Galatians 2 and verse 3, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Titus was a Gentile convert of Paul. And Titus is a pastor of the church in Crete. And his name means nurture. And the theme of the little book of Titus is priorities in the order of a local church. And historically what you got is Paul is writing to Titus and pretty much instructing him on pastoring. Just like he did to Timothy in First and Second Timothy. And doctrinally the epistle is going to lay out exactly what you need to teach is needful in the church. You know the leadership. You know the doctrine and good works. Inspirationally an effective ministry needs order authority, and discipline. Now, a quick little breakdown. Chapter 1, you got qualified bishops compared to the gainsayers. Chapter 2, he talks about sound doctrine. Chapter 3, he talks a lot about maintaining good works, having a pattern of good works. With that being said, let's just jump in the book and see what we get into. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul says, in hope of eternal life, which a God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God promised eternal life before the world began. He saw through his foreknowledge who would be a part of the elect. He didn't choose who would be elect. He didn't choose who would get in Christ. But through his foreknowledge, he knew who would choose of their own free will to get in. And... That phrase, eternal life, in hope of eternal life. If salvation was, you know, dependent on how you live, you wouldn't really have eternal life. And I don't see why people don't understand that. And if you don't deserve salvation when you got it, how do you think you're going to deserve to keep it? It's eternal life because it's eternal. And if you could lose it, then it's not really eternal life. It would be temporary life temporary until the time that you sinned but it's not temporary life it's eternal life and that god promised that eternal life titus 1 5 for this cause left i thee in crete that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as i had appointed thee so paul wants titus to get together some faithful men and ordain them as elders in every city and he says, if any be blameless. Now he's going to lay out the qualifications again, kind of like he told Timothy. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Now blameless doesn't mean sinless. You know, you're not going to find somebody out there that's sinless. If you go around looking for somebody that's sinless, you're never going to find them. It doesn't mean he doesn't mess up or have faults even. You just don't want a guy who is consistently accused of just bad behavior all the time i mean if you're a godly person then you're going to be falsely accused obviously of doing things that you didn't do and that's a different story but you know you're going to know if the man is blameless or not you're going to know if are these false accusations or is he really just going out and being a bad guy all the time you want a guy that's blameless not somebody that's out there constantly involved in something he shouldn't be the next thing it says the husband of one wife having faithful children you want a guy who is faithful to the one wife that he has and is training up his children in the way they should go it's it's a very ideal to have a guy who has a good family life you know if he's got a good family life obviously he's going to have a good life taking care of the church family it says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, 
not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. So he is the steward of God and needs to know Bible doctrine. He needs to have the mysteries down. He should be able to tell you what they are and explain them. You know, I heard a guy one time who, he believed that husband and one, lot, husband and one wife means one marriage ceremony. So he believed that if a man was divorced and remarried, that he was disqualified to pastor. So he said, the only thing that I care about when it comes to having a pastor, he said, as long as he has only been married one time, I'm fine with him being the pastor. That's the only qualification that he looked at. That's what he told me. Uh, that's that's a little crazy. I look at way more stuff than that when it comes to, do I want this person as my pastor? You want a guy that's a steward of God, that knows Bible doctrine. Does he have the mysteries of God down? Can he tell you what they are and what they mean? It says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So if this guy's a steward of God, he needs to be a steward of the mysteries. So it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So he needs to know what those mysteries are. Do you know what the mysteries are? For example, the mystery of iniquity. Could you explain that to the people? Do you know what it is? Do you know what the mystery of godliness is? Do you know the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mis or the mystery of the body of Christ? And all the mysteries, could you lay those out? All the mysteries, they uh, keep your doctrine straight. If you cons consistently uh, review and go over those mysteries, it'll help keep your doctrine straight. If you consistently teach the people that's under you all those mysteries, it'll keep their doctrine straight. And that's one of the things that Paul goes over with Titus is sound doctrine. And then it gets a little harder the qualifications do as it goes down the next thing he, he said was be slow to anger you know not soon angry you know that's a hard thing to do it can be hard to control your temper you don't want a hothead you know and then it says not given to wine you don't want a man who drinks alcohol or any kind of any kind no striker you know someone who's quick to just get in a fight slap somebody like will smith at the oscars going to smack that kid in the face you know uh, you know, that's someone, you know, a striker, someone who's quick to get in a fight. You know, if somebody's making fun of you in the congregation, you can't just go smack them upside the head, you know. You know, not greedy of filthy lucre. And that means he doesn't need to be in it for the money and, it, you know, extort people's money. I mean, you could even be greedy of filthy lucre that isn't even going to yourself. Maybe you just guilt people unbiblically to give, you know, unnecessary amounts or amounts that don't need to be given and use verses out of context to make people feel like they, you know, they're going to die in a car wreck tomorrow if they don't give a certain amount in the offering plate or that something's going to happen to their spouse if they don't start bringing their money and their, their fancy jewelry in to the church. I mean, the money may not necessarily go be going to the pastor saying that, but his motive could be he's greedy of filthy lucre to just keep making the church get bigger and build onto the building, have nicer things. Sometimes it gets to a level of extortion and manipulation tactics to get people to give so much money. It also gives people the idea in their mind, well, you got to have tons of money to do something for God. And they think, well, I don't have a ton of money, so I, I can't really do nothing for God. That's a completely false i know some things you do for god may cost a lot of money but that isn't something that you have to do and if you don't have the money to do it there are an infinite times more ways amount more ways to do something for god that's just completely free for example i wouldn't call what i'm doing on here the greatest work on earth obviously but it's costed me not hardly anything to do what i'm doing on here i mean i have to have the internet but I'd most likely have that anyway. You know, I'd have to have, you know, uh, a phone to record all these lessons, but 
most likely I'm going to have a phone anyway. It's not costing me any money to do what I'm doing. It's just costing me a lot of time. And if you have time, if you can give your time, that's even better than money. You know, I don't pay anything to put these studies out. It's all done free. I don't make any money off the studies. I put them out for free. I wouldn't have it any other way. I uh, cringe at the idea of putting this out f for money. And Titus 1.8, it says, But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. So we can't go over all of these. I did a study on Titus, verse by verse. So I can't go over all these right now, or you know, we'd never get done. But the next one is a lover of hospitality. The guy needs hospitality. You know, how does he act when he's around the people? Well, you know, when he's not in the pulpit. Maybe he's they're coming over to his house or they're going or he's going to their house or just out, you know, uh, in, in the fellowship hall or, or something like that. How does he act around them? Does he seem like he thinks he's on some type of pedestal and won't fellowship with the people just like he's one of the people? Or does he have this, you know, the man of kind of kind of like a man of God mindset where he thinks, you know, when he walks in, everyone needs to be mystified and that he thinks that he's on kind of a higher plane or level than everybody else with this high up position. And, you know, he's the man of God and all these other people are just sheep. You know, how does, would he be willing to serve the people and, you know, treat them even better than himself, you see? Is he a lover of hospitality? And, you know, just a lover of good men. Do, 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 I see this a lot where I've seen uh, preachers where they start showing so much love for the lost people who may be coming and downing kind of the godly men, showing so much favor to the lost people. Oh, you got to favor them and, so that they'll get saved, things like that which isn't necessarily a bad thing always, but you know, you want somebody who enjoys being around the good men, the good godly men, more than they do being around the lost people. And it says sober, just, holy, temperate. You know, all these qualifications, and these are ideal qualifications. You're not going to find somebody that is all these things 100% of the time. You're not going to find somebody that's holy 100% of the time or just 100% of the time or temperate 100% of the time or not soon angry 100% of the time. I mean, you got to have realistic expectations here. But the guy needs hospitality. How does he act around people, you know, when he's not preaching? And uh, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Look at that holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. You know, the does he got the King James Bible and believes it, not holding it in unrighteousness, as it talks about in Romans, people holding the truth in unrighteousness. You know, he's been taught against that, hopefully. So he's going to hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. You know, a lot of, People, they start out, they know that the King James Bible is right. They've been taught that that's the Bible that they should stick by, but they don't hold fast to faithful word as they've been taught. They don't hold fast to all those clear, foundational, doctrinal truths that they were taught by a good man that, that raised them up the right way. But if he does hold fast to faithful word as he hath been taught, and keep that sound doctrine, then he can do the work and do it right. If he has sound doctrine, then he teaches a thing exactly how that specific thing is taught in the Bible. That's sound doctrine. And it says in Titus 1, 10 through 11, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. So just like Paul said to Timothy, to Timothy in the other pastoral epistles, he says the love of money is the root of all evil. And a lot of guys are, uh, 
or pastors out there are, are pastoring for filthy lucre's sake, doing it for the money. And Paul said their mouths must be stopped. They can subvert whole houses. You know, I've heard of that happening just in my short time as a Christian. You know, I've been a Christian since like 2010. And I've seen, not at the church that I go to, but I've heard about it and know of families that the the pastor just wrecked their whole house. You know, he had uh, women bringing in their jewelry and they were bringing their jewelry and the husband was coming down there trying to get the jewelry back and everything else, crazy stuff. You know, that guy's kind of in it for filthy lucre's sake. You know, even if the money wasn't going to him, he had some motives behind it that shouldn't have been there, most likely. And then chapter 2, in verse 2, he says, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. So just the, not even somebody with an office, the aged men, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. So, you know, there's not just one set of rules for a pastor or a deacon. You know, there's these rules ought to go to everybody. And it says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So see that? As becometh holiness. Well, that means their behavior should match what you would expect from a holy woman. Becometh like like the match her behavior should match somebody that's claiming to be a Christian and not a false accuser you know we have enough false accusing going on from lost people accusing us so we don't need false accusations from our own fellow Christians then not given to much wine and the fact that it says not given to much wine doesn't mean you can have a little because look at First Timothy three three and Titus one seven. It uses the phrase "not given to wine" as a "not given to it." Period. So the excess is in the wine itself, not just in large amounts. Titus two four that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You know, I've had, I've heard of, you know, working out, you know, in the workplace and stuff. I've heard older women telling younger women to never get married or never have kids. This is because many times they, that woman themselves has a horrible husband. So they can't imagine the idea of a woman having a good husband and good kids and loving life as a, as a uh, wife and mother. So they paint the life of a married woman with kids as something undesirable and paint it as, as like, you know, you get married and have kids, you'll just never be able to have fun anymore or do what you want to do. And same thing for men. That I've heard men paint married life that way where you're just tied down and you can't go out and do the things that you used to do. And But really think about it. Why would you want to go do the things that you used to do? You know, there's a time that you need to grow up and quit acting like a kid. But if someone loves their spouse and their children, then it will make the hard times with their spouse and children way smoother. I mean, you could, you'll be able to put up with their faults a lot easier. And this is something that can be taught. You know, a, a person doesn't have to have this this feeling of being in love all the time to love their spouse all the time. You know, this is something that can be taught, that somebody can teach you and you could even teach yourself. So Paul says that they may teach the young women to love their husbands. It can be taught. It doesn't have to be just some feeling of, like on the movies all the time, where you're just going, you got to have this feeling or you're just ready to get a divorce, you know, like some people are. You know, they say, well, I'm just not in love with this person anymore, so I think I need to get a divorce. You know, that's crazy. You know, you can teach yourself to always love that person through the ups and downs. You see, today people are being taught to love themselves first, they're being taught not to be defined as a mother and a wife, and they need to figure out who they are. And they say, well, you're spending all this time being a mom and a, a wife that you you just don't know who you are anymore. You need to take some time away and find out who you really are. Things like that, stupid stuff, and not just with a wife, but it could, that could also happen to the man as well. And Paul's just laying this stuff down. You know, if if all of the 
families in the church can't get their roles right. You know, the woman get her role right in the family, and the man can't get his role right, which most of the time it's the woman that has it right, and the man is just, he doesn't care anything about the Bible. You know, when you go to church, what do you, it, you don't see a bunch of men in there without their wives. Usually you're seeing a bunch of women who are wanting their husbands to come in. But you, uh, if you can get the your role right in the family, the woman do her role, the man do his role as the spiritual leader, then it's going to help that local church. So they need to figure out who they are. And this can be done by the aged women teaching them how they ought to be. And same thing with the men. And then it says to be, you know, teaching them to be, in verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And when a, a woman reads this verse, many times the devil gets in your mind when you read this and says, you know, a slave, you're going to be a slave and a doormat to your husband. And when you read, you know, keepers at home, he says, well, you just got to have, have the wife of a boring housewife, things like that. And I don't ever use these verses to say that a woman must stay at home. But I think that if you did that and you did it right, that would be the most happy you could be for most women. If you did it and did it right and your husband was doing what he was supposed to do, that would be the happiest that you would be for most people, for most Christians. But the devil gets in your mind and he says, oh, you'll just be a slave and a doormat and a boring, live the life of a boring housewife who never gets to do anything fun. But at the same time, you got the husband, he's going out to work. Do you think he's just living this glamorous life, going to work every day? That's not a very fun, it's not too fun to go out to go to work every day either. But, uh, you know, a woman, it says a woman needs to be obedient to their own husband's. Because if they don't, then they, you know, they ruin the picture. The picture of the husband, you see, the husband and wife relationship pictures Jesus Christ and his bride. The woman leading the relationship ruins the picture. The woman leading the relationship makes as much sense as the bride of Christ leading Christ. You know, that wouldn't make sense. That's backwards. Shouldn't the man step up and be the spiritual leader of the home? And I'm aware that the reason a lot of women are leading is because the man won't step it up. And I understand that completely. But it says, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And I, I remember years ago, there was a blasphemy challenge where they were getting kids to deny the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and things like that. And I've heard over the years, many people saying, you know, I, I don't think this person can get saved because they've committed the unpardonable sin. They blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And they say, if you've blasphemed, then, you know, you can never be saved. Well, I'm thinking, have you not read these verses? You know, a lot of wives commit blasphemy by ruining the picture. It says, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, they put themselves as the head which makes as much sense as the bride of Christ being the head of Christ. And, you know, I know most husbands aren't doing what they're supposed to do, but you won't ever win a lost husband any other way than by what the Bible says. And it says in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 4, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaguing the hair and wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible and the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know, you the, the woman needs to have a meek and quiet spirit, be in subjection to her own husband. And that, that way, if that husband is not saved, you know, he sees you living godly, doing what you need to do, you know, not being overbearing and all these things like that, you can win him over. He can be won by the chaste conversation of the wife. And then he says in, in Titus 2, 6 and 7, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, 
in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing corruptness, gravity, sincerity. You know, you need a pattern of good works. Not this thing where you do good on Sunday and Wednesday and go out partying on Friday and Saturday. You know, that's not a pattern of good works. I mean, you're up and down. You got good works this day. And then you're just looking like a lost person the next day. You need to show yourself a pattern of good works. Then it says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So they're going to say enough evil about you without you giving them more ammo to put in their false accusation gun, you see. Having a good conscience that, it says in 1 Peter 3.16, that having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. You know, there's going to be people that falsely accuse. Just make sure all the accusations are false. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's a great verse because it shows that every man has a chance to get in Christ. Jesus died for the sins of every man. Your sins have already been paid for, but have you accepted the payment? It says in verse 11, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world and it is a present evil world according to galatians 1 4 and if we go along with the ungodliness and worldly lusts then how can we save anybody in the world he tells us what to do in verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ since this is a present evil world our hope should be above and not on anything down here you see, Jesus. the verse also shows us that Jesus is God and Savior. Jesus Christ is God, and God purchased us with his own blood. And we're looking for the appearing of the great God and our Savior. And then he says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So good works can't save you, keep you saved, or prove you're saved. But every born-again believer needs to get zealous of good works. And if you're not, then you need to pray that you'll get that way. Now, chapter 3, Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see, any time that works for salvation, crowd tells you that, you know, works play a part in your salvation. We'll just show them this verse. It's by the mercy of God that we're saved. He says in verse 8, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So, so while we don't believe good works saves you, keeps you saved, or necessarily proves you're saved, you still need them. Paul's really letting us know that we need to have works. He, he said in the last chapter, show a pattern of good works. He said to be zealous of good works. And here he says to maintain good works. And he says in verse 10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Meaning, you know, if you tell a guy the right doctrine a few times and he still won't listen, then you got a right to reject him. And you can't just go around saying just anybody's a heretic if they don't agree with every little thing that you're saying. That's what a lot of people do is, you know, they go to a church and they see the pastor and if he disagrees on very minor things, even if it's like quite a few minor little things, they say, well, this guy's a heretic, I'm going somewhere else. But a person isn't a heretic for disagreeing with you over little things. Someone who is an heretic is teaching something that could damn somebody to hell. For example, someone who teaches that water baptism is what saves you, that is damnable heresy. That would be a heretic. And, you know, if you've told that person uh, the right doctrine a few times, you know, you've got every right to reject that person. But that's another pastoral epistle by the Apostle Paul, the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to Titus.